Hello, welcome back. We are continuing our journey down the alimentary canal. Um, you may have just finished the video on the stomach, and so now we're gonna be moving on into the small intestine. Um, so the small intestine is made up of three parts. We have the duodenum, which is the first kind of a C-shaped piece about six to nine inches long um, coming off of the stomach, and then that transitions into the jejunum, um, and then the ileum, which is the longest part. Of the different parts of the small intestine, the jejunum is the primary location of the nutrient absorption. So that big picture idea that I presented in the first video is the goal is to take those macromolecules and break them down into their small subunits. It is now in the small intestine that we have the opportunity or the ability to take those small subunits and um, allow them to diffuse across the membrane the digestive epithelium to make their way into the bodily fluids, whether it's blood or lymph. And we'll see which ones go where as we go through this. Um, it says about 90% of all of our nutrient absorption takes place in the small intestine with a little bit of um, some nutrients coming in in the end of the small intestine, like the ileum towards the large intestine. But the bulk of our nutrients are gonna be absorbed here in the small intestine. Uh, so here's those, those components. We have the duodenum is the blue, jejunum is the purpley, and the ileum is kind of the orangish. And then I show you a picture here of the mesenteries. So I didn't lecture over these, but you should have read through the different folds. Um, the visceral peritoneum, once it's wrapping around the tube comes back together. So it's wrapping around the tube, comes back together as this double membrane, which is the mesentery. Um, and that's what holds nerves and blood vessels and things. And so you can kind of see that they're spread out in that picture of the small intestine. And then just for um, explanation, because some people wonder why we pick the name small intestine when it's the longest one, the small has to do with the diameter of the tubes. The small intestine is smaller in diameter, the large intestine is larger in diameter. As far as length goes, the small intestine is about 15 to 20 feet long, the large intestine is about six feet long. And obviously you're going to have variation from person to person, um, but our small intestine is definitely a lot longer. Um, and that increased length helps to increase surface area for nutrient absorption. So that kind of makes sense. All right, so here we have, again, a picture showing a section of the alimentary canal, and this is very similar to the first picture that we looked at in the layers of the alimentary canal. So here's our four layers, serosa, muscularis externa, submucosa, and mucosa. So we're seeing all four of those layers, um, very much like how you learned them at the beginning with the plexuses, the muscularis mucosa, the blood vessels, the nerves, the lymph, those types of things. But I wanted to, in this um, picture, make sure that we see there's three modifications of the lining of the small intestine that increases surface area to make that nutrient absorption efficient. So we have these guys here called plica circularis, sometimes known as circular folds, I think is what they're called in your lab manual. So circular folds or plica circularis are these permanent folds of the mucosa, right? So here's our mucosa right here. That's our mucosa. Um, they're permanent folds. They don't um, disappear like the rugi in the stomach. So you read about that. So the rugi kind of helps stretch. And then when the stomach is empty, they fold in on themselves. The plica circularis don't do that. They're a permanent fold, kind of make the inner lining of the small intestine look wrinkly. And then on the surface of those plica circularis are the villi, right? So I kind of highlighted those. This is one villus here in the micrograph this would be one villus here. So then on the fold, we have another fold. So it folds upon folds. Um, and then we can't see it here in this picture, but these um, columnar epithelial cells, they are going to have microvilli. So if this is one cell or two cells, they're kind of next to each other like this. So there you're going to have the microvilli. So you have circular folds, you have villi, and you have microvilli. And so what this does is it increases the surface area because it is across these plasma membranes where nutrients are going to be carried uh, eventually into the bloodstream. So the more pl actual plasma membrane surface we have, the more efficient we would be in absorbing those nutrients. 
think I have a statistics here. If our small intestine, the 20 foot long small intestine was just a flat tube, if it didn't have any of these folds in it, it would give us about three and a half square feet um, of the absorptive area, three and a half square feet. But because of these folds, it gives us about 2,200 square feet. So 2,200 square feet of this surface right here of this absorptive microvilli, because wherever you have microvilli, you have all of those microvilli on the villus, and then you have all of the villus, all of these little villi on all of those folds. So folds upon folds upon folds. So all of those things help to increase that surface area. Okay. All right, so taking a closer look at one of those villi, you can kind of see what's going on. This is, since this is the place of absorption, we would expect every villus to have some kind of fluid collection area. So we do have a blood capillary. Um, so you can see the arterial end going in, goes to the capillary bed, and then we have a venule coming out. So think back to our general circulation, arterial feeds into capillary beds, capillary beds drain into venules. So as this blood is coming in, it's going to be very, running very closely to these absor absorptive cells. They will be bringing in the nutrients, and then as it will leave, it will be rich in these nutrients. Now, the two nutrients that actually get picked up by the capillaries um, are the monosaccharides and the amino acids. So they actually go directly into the bloodstream. The other nutrient that we uh, use for, for nutrients is the lipids. The lipids actually go into the lymph, and this lymph capillary specifically is called a lacteal, so that's unique to um, villus. Lymph capillaries, you can call it a lymph capillary, or it can be a lacteal, um, but it is just a special name for a lymph capillary found in each villus. So you can see that in this bigger picture over here, that every villus is gonna have its own lacteal, and every villus will have its own capillary bed. So you're going to have a good depositing site for those absorbed nutrients. Um, all right, so then I wanted to, I'm just going to have kind of like a whiteboard here to draw the concept of brush border enzymes. This is what I would normally have drawn up on the board if we were in class. So let's say I'm drawing some of these absorptive cells with their little microvilli. So here's our little nucleus. Da, 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 da. So underneath within the um, areolar connective tissue, the lamina propria, you're gonna have your blood supply, right? So that's my little capillary, and you're going to have your lymph. Okay. So then in the lumen, what is kind of coming down the line that just came from the stomach and the duodenum, maybe you have some dipeptides. So these are like the proteins have been broken down um, as much as they can into the two amino acid partners. These are called dipeptides. We also might see some disaccharides. Okay, so I'm just going to draw one because it's a little bit harder. So these di dimers, um, the two amino acids hooked together, um, the two sugars hooked together, the monosaccharides, these are too big to fit through the plasma membrane. That Not even a, a ion channel or a carrier protein can do that. Um, so let's say the blue channel is going to be for proteins, and I'll make the purple for sugar. Right? So these can only um, allow the monomers to come through. So on the surface of each one of these little microvilli, the tips of these little microvilli, these yellow things, this is what we call the brush border enzymes. Okay, so they're enzymes embedded in the apical surface of these epithelial cells, these cells with microvilli. And what happens is if you have the, let's say the lumen, oh, all the substances is moving through, it's kind of peristalsing and segmenting, these membrane bound enzymes are gonna come up and come into contact, or this is gonna come into contact with, um, that disaccharide in this case and break it up into individual monosaccharides. 
okay? They've broken that bond, and now the individual monosaccharides can be absorbed across the epithelium via facilitated diffusion. And eventually, and then there'll be some channels down here, and then they will diffuse and make their way into the bloodstream. And it will be the same thing for the protein. So this protein is gonna come in, it's gonna bump into that brush border enzyme, it will break up into your individual amino acids, and now these guys will be able to diffuse into the bloodstream. So this is how your amino acids and your monosaccharides finally get to that, that big picture goal of being able to be absorbed into the digestive epithelium, is they are broken down by the amylase in the saliva, they're broken down by um, the pepsinogen, the pepsin, activated pepsin in the stomach. We haven't got to the pancreas yet, but we'll be talking about the pancreas also releasing protein enzymes and um, more amylase to break down the starches. So by the time they reach the small intestine, they either are already individual monomers or they will be turning into individual monomers by these brush border enzymes. Your lab manual does a really good job of describing these brush border enzymes in the lab. Um, there's a big chart in lab you'll see. So then what about the lipids though? So lipids, remember lipids are um, fats. And so they're lipid soluble. And so they can just diffuse through. But they do not go into the bloodstream, they go into the lacteal. I know that bright yellow is really bright. Hopefully it comes through. So fats, because they're lipid soluble, they can diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer. They don't really need the enzymes. They get um, they do get processed. So I'll put some squiggly bits in here. They get processed into what are called I'll pick a dark color, chylomicrons. So chylomicrons are the, it's like the fats and some cholesterol and some proteins all in this big blob. They actually get exocytosed out of the basal end of the cell and then get picked up by those flappy cells within the lymph. So your fat actually go through your lymph flow um, before it gets dumped back into your general circulation, right? At your subclavian veins via your thoracic duct um, and your cisterna chyli, right? Chylomicrons, cisterna chyli. Um, draining all of the lymph from your digestive organs comes up um, through your thoracic duct and dumps into your left subclavian vein. So it is at the surface, the actual cellular surface of your small intestines where we do the final breakdown and absorption of our macromolecules. So that big picture, we're here. We've just accomplished our goal is to absorb all of these um, monomers that made up all of the food items that we eat, the large macromolecules. All right, so again, this is what we're seeing happening. So um, our sugars, our proteins, and our fats, all of these are going into either the lymph or the blood uh, within the villi. All right, so I think, oh, let me see. Oh, I wanted to talk about before we get on to, um, this is gonna be a little shorter of a video, in the stomach video, we talked about the enterogastric reflex where the um, intestines inhibited the stomach. Now we have a couple other ones that are mentioned here. We have the gastroenteric and the gastroileal. So again, these are local reflexes, uh, not local, they're the short reflexes of the parasympathetic kind of visceral reflexes. So gastroenteric is when um, food is coming into the stomach, it stretches, and what it will do is it'll increase the peristalsis along the intestinal tract saying, hey, we just got a big bunch of food coming in the stomach, be prepared, we're going to be sending you food in a couple hours, so move along down the line, get that food out of the small intestine and head towards the large intestine. And then we have our gastroileal reflex, which is the stomach, again, the stretching of the stomach will send a signal to the ileocecal valve, um, which is at the very end of the ileum, right at the beginning of the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine, and will allow it to open that valve to move that uh, waste material from the ileum into the large intestine. So those are our three major reflexes. We had enterogastric, which is the intestine slowing down the stomach. We have the gastroenteric, 
stomach speeding up the intestines, and the gastroileal, the stomach um, opening that, that ileocecal valve between the small intestine and the large intestine. All right, I want to make sure I got that. Okay, I will see you next for, looks like we're going to go on to the pancreas and the liver. See you next time.